including the 2012 Prime Minister's Science Media Communications Prize and some other prizes also. Many of you will be aware of him, particularly through his thought-provoking science blogs and contributions to Radio New Zealand and other forums in, in this country. Uh, always good value for the comments he makes and uh, the, the reaction he generates to the comments, which is good. Um, today he's going to talk about the book that he's co-authored Paul Callahan, which I think you will find very, oh, I'm hoping you'll find very interesting, I'm sure you will, um, cover, covering the kick-starting of New Zealand's innovation economy, and, and of course, here at Envy, that's a, a very close topic, a very close interest for us, and so we, we are also listening and hope to learn a lot from today's talk, and uh, look forward to hearing you, and welcome. Thanks very much. Well, it's good to see a, a good turnout. Um, uh, it's, um, I, I am getting a little sick of talking about the book, actually, um, <laughs> but I'm about, I think I'm about halfway through the, through the number of talks um, that I'm giving on this, so it's, so it's downhill from here, I hope, anyway. But uh, this, is a, this has actually worked out, the timing for this has actually worked out very well, because I was due to give a, a talk at the Treasury a couple of weeks ago, which would have been a much more technical um, talk than this one. This was, this is, this is somewhere, this is a bit more, you know, my normal public talk, I've, I've, um, uh, I've put in a bit more technical information to sort of whet your appetite, and, and I can actually uh, uh, save that appetite if you come along next week. I think it's Friday next week, uh, I'll be talking at Treasury, and I'll get more into some of the technical details of some of the actual, some of the research that I do. But, um, yeah, so today I'm going to give you something, something of a, of a, a I'm not going to talk about everything that's in the book, I, I don't have time. Um, I, there's a 24-hour version of this talk, um, if anyone's interested, that I, that I you know, give as part of a, 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 a course that I teach at Victoria University. Um, but this is, this is going to sort of give you a, a, a tour of some of the, some of the topics um, uh, in the book. Um, so, so, of course, I have to acknowledge um, my co-author, a very important um, uh, person in New Zealand, uh, one of our visionary thinkers and scientists, Paul Callahan. Um, and if you do want to, if you want to see the Sir Paul take on this material, you, you can because there's a lot of uh, YouTube video of, of Paul. In fact, I have um, I have a, a, a video of Paul. I think this is a strategy presentation that I've embedded on my blog, and this is actually still one of the most um, uh, hit on pages on my blog. People are obviously still watching to see what what, what Sir Paul thought and what he's contributed uh, to the debate. Um, so so and, it, and it's you know it is very sad that he wasn't able to make it. Uh, towards the end of the project, he passed away about halfway through. Um, so, we, so, um, uh, so we didn't get to see how it turned out. He didn't get to see what the, <coughs> what the, the final answer was, unfortunately. Um, but he did make some really important contributions, and, and of course, he he um, he really kicked off this this discussion in a number of ways around you know what's the relationship between science and innovation uh, and the economy in New Zealand. And his first contribution, his major contribution, was. To his book Walter Wecker, um, and then the oops, I'm used to this. Um, uh, and then the, the follow-up title, uh, you know, just, the, 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 just get off the grass. So, and this came about, uh, I think, I think Paul had sort of uh, whetted his appetite uh, for for getting into uh, into economics, um, and and you know, having having written written a book that was uh, partly his views, but partly a lot of other people's views. He really wanted to sort of put his case on the table. Uh, you know, do a lot of research and background reading, and so that, that's where this book came from. Uh, Paul coming into my office and, and asking me uh, if, if I would collaborate with him. And I think at the time, he, he, you know, he'd, he'd been through the, his first uh, stage was battle with cancer. Um, he was, you know, there was a brief period where he wasn't sure what the outcome was going to be, um, and it wasn't long after he started the project that he realised that the cancer was in fact going to be terminal. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm grateful that he was he was able to pass the project. 
Um, so actually, I want to start this talk with another uh, great New Zealander. This was a this was an economist, Bill Phillips, um, who, who perhaps perhaps our most well known uh, uh, went most well known economist to come out of New Zealand. Uh, he, you know, it's a classic Kiwi story. He he was born uh, uh, somewhere um, in the Hawke's Bay, somewhere uh, near Dannybrog, um, and of course, like all young New Zealanders, his uh, when he when he uh, when he was old enough, he wanted to set off and see the world. Um, so he started off, you know, his first job um, was in Queensland as a, as a crocodile hunter. Um, you know, not, not quite the standard path for, uh, for people on their OE today, but, but nonetheless we know there's a lot of New Zealanders that do leave uh, for, for, uh, for greener shores in Queensland. And from there, he, he went on to China. Um, from crocodiles, um, uh, he, he had to face the invading Japanese army um, in, in China. So he actually had, he had to flee the... Japanese army, and he, and he fled across uh, across Russia on the Trans-Siberian Express, believe it or not. Um, and so, having escaped the Japanese, of course, he ended up in, in the UK, like a lot of New Zealanders do, um, and 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 had to confront the Germans. Um, so it was quite an interesting start to his uh, to his career. Um, and he he ended up working for the for the Royal Air Force, um, and he was working on on bombers. And after the after the war, he put a lot of the uh, engineering skills that he'd learnt. Um, uh, and, and working on bombers to, to good use, and he actually, um, uh, after after training as an economist, uh, he actually went on to build uh, and some analog computing devices uh, uh, to actually um, uh, model the growth of economies or the inputs and outputs of economies. So these are these are wonderful things, and I particularly like these things because I'm a physicist, um, and I I I um, in my day job I study the flow of of liquids through very small pipes, right? And this is the this is a, a one of the versions of the Moniac, and it's actually an analog computer that's based on the flow of water, right? So you, you connect it up to a tap, you turn the tap on, water flows through this device, and you can look at you know and there there are uh, there are valves and pumps and buckets, right? And and the and, and the uh, the way the device can be constructed is to model those inputs and outputs of an economy. So in principle, you can you can simulate an economy using this. Um, and, and so for me, you know, this is this is an interesting segue between my life as a physicist, where I'm trying to understand the physics of, of flows, and, and the work that I'm now doing uh, in economics and complex systems, uh, where I'm trying to understand things about economies. And so there's actually there's a there's a version just across the road. So I guess a lot of people probably have been to been to see this. I think it, I think they actually this is over in the Reserve Bank uh, uh, Museum, which is just not very far from here. And I think on the first Wednesday of every month they actually run it. Now I've never, I've never actually been down um, to see it. Uh, I really should, uh, really should uh, get down there to see it. Um, but, but you know, this is a version that, that's been built uh, to model the New Zealand economy. Um, and, and you know, so as I said, you can, you can see where the taps are, right? You can, you can connect it up, and the water flows through, and you can, you can watch what happens in the economy. And you know, I guess, I guess if you got it right. If you, if you had all the, the right bells and whistles uh, and valves and pipes and buckets, right, then you could perhaps simulate, you know, economic growth over time. Um, and this is this is a figure that that, that um, this is GDP uh, per capita uh, over the last uh, 40 years. Uh, and you'll see New Zealand here, uh, and you'll see a number of other countries. Um, but you know, and and um, in the early 1970s, of course, we were. Uh, you know, we were quite comparable in, in GDP per capita to the, to the OECD average, um, but by the end, you know, for, uh, after 40 years, um, you know, in fact, we've slipped well behind. And so it's what, you know, this is often described as the New Zealand paradox because, in a lot of ways, uh, people think that our economy does, you know, the, the settings that you'd normally think <coughs> uh, govern the success of economies, you know, things like uh, regulation, you know, ease of starting business, size of government, taxation. You know, we have those settings. As far as most um, uh, uh, people people look at things, you know, those settings are pretty good. Um, so, so what is it about the New Zealand economy um, that, that that you know we perhaps means that we've um, we've fallen off the pace of a lot of these other countries? And some countries have come from well behind. So you'll see here that um, you know South Korea in 1970 was had a considerably smaller GDP per capita than New Zealand, and it's by growing faster. Over the last 40 years, it's actually surpassed us in GDP per capita. So it's an interesting question, and I think it's still a still a matter of debate, okay, and, and um, as to as to why this is. 
And, and so one of the things that I'm interested in is something that you won't find in the, in the, the MONIAC, right, this Analog Computers in New Zealand Economy. I'm interested in, in what effect does science and innovation have on the economy? Um, and what might, what might be the, the uh, factors that limit our ability in New Zealand to, uh, uh, to benefit from some of the fruits of science and technology that other countries clearly have? Um, so this is, this is really my area, and, and as I said, you won't find it on the money act. And I guess my, um, uh, uh, my, one of my research goals is perhaps to, uh, to figure out how you might uh, put, put something like this uh, into a money act or into a model uh, of an economy. So I'm going to start out uh, with, with, with my analysis of things. I'm going to start out by talking about our exports. And of course, this is, this is where the title, uh, Get Off the Grass, comes from, right? because we, we know that we're very dependent on, on agriculture. Our, our agriculture sector is actually the, our, our biggest exporting sector. Uh, we do have a manufacturing sector uh, that that's, that's, has been growing. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a range of, of industries in, in, in our manufacturing sector. But by and large, we've, you know, it, it's our agricultural sector that, that earns us the bulk of our export dollars. But when I compare, you know, when you compare New Zealand to a country like Denmark, um, you see that, that you know, the situation is very different. Uh, Denmark has a, has a large agricultural sector. It's about the same size as ours uh, when measured in terms of exports. But it's actually exporting a much wider range, a much more diverse uh, uh, set of goods and products uh, than New Zealand does. Um, and, and clearly, you know, this is, this is one of the ways that, that countries like Denmark have, have boosted their, their GDP per capita. Right? They're exporting more. Right? They're selling more goods uh, to the rest of the world. Um, and, and some of these goods are very high value. Uh, and so if we did want to, if we did want to catch uh, Denmark, for instance, then we might want to, uh, to boost our exports similarly. And indeed, you know, our, our primary sector does have a plan, our agricultural sector does have a plan to greatly increase uh, its export volumes, um, and so there is a there is a there is a, a school of thought out there that we can do it from agriculture, and that we can grow um, our, our export earnings in agriculture sufficiently that we can actually um, uh, catch up with the rest of the OECD. But of course, you know there are some problems with us, uh, and one of one of the problems is that we, you know, because a lot of our agricultural goods we're not we're not. Um, we're not value adding, right? We're not we're not processing those agricultural goods. We're often uh, exporting them as, as uh, raw or, or as ingredients. Um, we have to rely on, on not on value add. We rely on 100% pure New Zealand brand, this 100% New Zealand pure brand, in order to to get a premium for our product. Um, and and we know that there's there's limitations to this, right? When we, when we look at uh, uh, we look at how much we can scale up uh, our agriculture. Um, you know, we know that this actually starts to damage our brand, and and so we have pictures like this um, appearing in the media. Uh, you know, the agricultural runoff, particularly from the dairy industry, is starting to cause uh, a lot of concern, um, and and this concern is being noticed by um, by people overseas, and and so this was this was um, a, a, a report in the Herald from a, a few weeks ago pointing out that, that the UK media are starting to pick up on this idea um, that we're not as clean and green. Um, as we like to make out, or at least as, we, as, as our marketers do. Um, and so we, we, we're starting to lose the edge potentially. And particularly if we're going to ramp up in agriculture, this is going to be an increasing uh, challenge for us. And of course then, then there was the recent, um, which was the recent um, uh, contamination scare uh, at Fonterra, actually very well timed uh, for, uh, for, for book sales, I have to say, um, but for the country, um, uh, not quite so good, right? And, and um, you know, it, it, it's turned out that it's not a dangerous form of botulism, or at least we think it, it's not. Um, but nonetheless, there was some contamination, and our failure to identify that contamination and, and the way we handled it uh, meant that, uh, you know, the New Zealand dollar over a couple of days plummeted, right? And this is the rest of the world telling us, well, we're actually quite worried that you're so reliant on dairy, and if there's a hiccup in your dairy industry, then we're, we're concerned about that. Um, and so, you know, there's a sense that we, that, that you know, we're, we're over-dependent on agriculture, that if, you know, we are going to, uh, uh, to follow this route of, um, uh, of you know, 
greatly increasing our exports in the, in the, in the primary sector, then there are risks to that. So, you know, how, do, how, how, how have other countries grown their economies? Well, I mean, Denmark, you know, I, I mentioned before, it, it continues to have a, uh, an has an agricultural uh, sector that's about the same size as ours. Um, and, and actually, you know, uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago, um, it was as dependent on the agricultural sector as we were. Uh, if I go back to 1995, uh, and I compare the, this is the New Zealand uh, mix of exports in 1995, and in 1995, uh, you know, our largest export was, was land meat, right? so we were living off the back of the land. Uh, and the, the Danish, you know, weren't all that different. Uh, they were living off bacon, right? So, um, uh, so the largest, uh, largest Danish export uh, was, in, was in bacon. And you know what's what's happened in our economy over the last 15 years is that we've we've switched to dairy, um, and and of course this has been one of our successes. Uh, this this um, uh, growth in our dairy industry, and, and we've done very well out of it. Uh, while the while the um, the Danes have uh, their largest export is now in pharmaceutical. Um, so their, their economy has gone in quite a different direction. They're, uh, they're Rather than um, rather than increasing their concentration of, the, of their exports uh, in their primary sector, uh, they've actually diversified. And, and you know, is there any is, is there any issue with this? Well, one of the issues that I'm really interested in is the knowledge content in these Depending products. The new meeting or we going? ID for zero. There's some interesting stuff going on behind these. <laughs> <laughs> I can confirm this is the first time I've ever interviewed Joe Burgess, so I'm really doing <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll keep going. I'm, I'm really interested in, in the knowledge content of these products. Um, and, and of course, there's, there's an enormous amount of knowledge that goes into, into our dairy industry. Right? And, and, and actually, our dairy industry is a, a, um, and our agricultural sector have been a big user um, of our public sector research. Um, so there's, there's no sense in which this, this product doesn't require uh, an awful lot of knowledge. However, you know, is there, you know, there's also an awful lot of knowledge that goes into pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical manufacturing, and is there any sort of difference um, in the um, in, in these types of knowledge? Is there any is there any reason why you might prefer uh, to learn about pharmaceuticals um, than you might prefer to learn about dairy? Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but I'm, I'm really going to this is going to be a, a, the focus of, of what I talk about at Treasury next week is trying to uh, trying to get into um, uh, uh, differences in knowledge. So I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about this today, but I'll I'll get more into that uh, next week. Um, and so, so, so we'll come back to this, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about why the sort of knowledge that goes into, into the agricultural industry might be different to the sort of knowledge that goes into the pharmaceutical industry in a while. Now, I'm, I'm interested in the, you know, if, you're, if I don't know if everybody's read the book yet, or, or if you're going to, I'm very interested in more. I'm more interested in these types of, 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 of products, right? I'm more interested in, in, in products that are uh, essentially more high technology, and and so I'm interested in where companies like Magritech come from. So I don't know if people have heard of Magritech. I, I like this example because this was a company that, that came out of St. Paul Callahan's research. Um, so this Paul was, um, uh, was interested in looking at, at sea ice formation down in Antarctica. And if you know the type of research that Paul did, uh, he, had to, he had to use very large um, uh, MRI machines, right, which normally require a, a very large lab. Right? In fact, at, at Massey University, uh, when I was an undergraduate there, Paul had one of the largest labs um, on campus, just to house his uh, his NMR machines. Um, if you want, you know, if, if, well, you, you simply can't take these things down to Antarctica, and you certainly can't take them out into the field. Um, so Paul had to work out a way of uh, he had to develop a technology that, that that could take what he could do in the laboratory and translate that into something that he could do in the field. And so he actually uh, worked out a way to use the Earth's magnetic field to do uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Right? And and so he actually had to make a portable uh, NMR device, um, and and having done that, you know, shortly afterwards he realised that that's a, that was a commercialisable product, um, and so today Magritex is a Wellington-based company that sell portable uh, uh, NMR or MRI machines to the um, oil industry, for example, so that they can look at rock samples and look at the porosity of rock uh, um, and the oil content of those rocks, and so that that was a company that came out of St Paul's research, and it's you know it's grown uh, it's grown well. Um, and of course, we've, you know, another company that you might uh, be aware of is HPS 110, which has come out of the Hutt Valley, 
um, from the high temperature to the kind of pivoting work. You know, there's, there's, as we start to scale up, there's Buckley systems, uh, which, which make um, electromagnets uh, for the semiconductor industry um, and for, for scientific equipment. Uh, you know, companies like Raycon, uh, Tate, uh, you know, NDA Engineering, which, is, which has come out of our, our primary sector more explicitly, and a company like Gallagher. You know, where do these companies come from? Uh, you know, could we have more of them? Or, or do, we, you know, do we have as many as, as we could? Um, that's a question I'm, I'm interested in. And when I started out this work, uh, and I went to my CEO at, at then Industrial Research Limited, Sean Coffey, I said, I'd like some money to study this, because I think I've got some interesting ideas to follow up on. He said, well, you, you, um, I'll give you the money, but you've got to call it the, uh, the Innovation Ecosystem Project. Um, and you know, I'm a, I'm a theoretical physicist, you know, I don't study ecosystems, and it always sounded like a bit of a buzzword for me. Um, but I said yes, because it was, <laughs> you know, it's money and scientists, right, will we'll, we'll do anything for some, uh, for some research dollars. Um, but it turns out that there, that there is an interesting analogy between uh, innovation ecosystems and real ecosystems. I mean, here's, a, here's normally what we think of when we think of an ecosystem, right? So these are, these are pictures um, uh, from some of my holidays around the country. You know, nice and green, you've got, you've got trees, um, some of them quite big. Uh, this is uh, uh, Tane Mahuta. Um, and, you know, some of them quite small, grasses and ferns, etc. Um, and so that's, you know, that's one way of looking at an ecosystem. You know, here's how a physicist uh, might look at an ecosystem. So, you know, so when I'm actually out on holiday, um, and instead of you know admiring the greenery, right, I'm, I'm I'm thinking of data like this. Uh, this is more how I see an ecosystem. And, and what this is, this is the distribution of biomass, right, within a within a forest. This is actually a California redwood forest. Uh, the data was was um, uh, collected in, in the U.S. And what they've done is they've um, collected the data. They've gone out and they've, they've estimated the mass of, of a particular um, uh, plant species. Um, so up the top, we have the we have the big you know in California there's big redwoods, in New Zealand it's the kauri and the, and the totara, uh, and and then looked at how 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 dense are these uh, plants distributed within the ecosystem. And uh, of course, if, if for big plants, right, we, you know we've all been out into, into ecosystems, right? There are generally not many um, large 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 trees. Uh, so although they, lower, they, they weigh a lot, they contribute a lot of biomass to the ecosystem, there are not many of them. However, when we come down here, we look at the grasses and the ferns, right, individually each, each plant doesn't weigh much, um, but of course we've got a lot of them. Okay? And, and, and what's really interesting to a physicist um, is that you'll, you'll notice that I'm going up in scales of 10 here, so this is a log-log plot, um, and so, so uh, this actually is a, is a, is a power law. Okay? And, and physicists are sort of you know, a bit like a cat staring into, into headlights, right? When physicists see power laws, um, it's very hard to look away. But what's really, really interesting um, is that when I plot when I plot the distribution of patents, so now now I'm going to get into, into some of my analysis, right? When I go around and I count up the intellectual property held at different firms, right? And so so at one end of this plot, um, at one end of this plot, I have companies that. Um, that have a small amount of intellectual property, they may have one or two patents, okay? Um, and, and so they don't, you know, individually they don't have a lot of intellectual property, uh, but there are a lot of them. So just like the small plants, right, in our ecosystem, um, there are a lot of these companies. And the, the big companies, the companies that have a lot of intellectual property, um, uh, companies like Christian Paco Healthcare, well, there aren't many of them, okay? And, and, and I've, I've cheated a little bit with this plot to get rid of some of the noise, so, so for those of you that, that do this, uh, this, this, this um, have a statistics background, I've used the cumulative distribution here just to get rid of some of the noise because uh, we're looking at quite a small data set for the, for the New Zealand um, uh, patent distribution. Um, but, but I've then rescaled those axes, so in fact uh, this is showing you the difference in the slopes of those power laws and actually uh, the power laws uh, are, are actually almost the same, um, uh, or the, at least the slope of those power laws. So it's you know, so so at this point, I was I was quite happy that um, that, I, that Sean Coffey had made me call this the Innovation Ecosystem Project uh, because indeed um, I'd found this mathematical mapping between a, 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 a real ecosystem and an innovation ecosystem. Okay, so that's that's kind of a cute trick. Um, is, is there anything useful that you can get from that? Well, one of the things you can start doing is you can start comparing ecosystems now. Right. So. 
So often when we often when people start talking about innovation, they might just be talk, they'll, they'll often use a use a figure like patents per capita. Okay, and and um, this is a different measure, a different way of looking at, at, at innovation, a different way of measuring uh, 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 patents, um, is by looking at the, at the actual distribution of patents amongst companies. And so we start to see some quite interesting things. And I'll, I'll, um, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can that you can interpret this. Uh, but one way is, is you can think of it as, a, as it's telling you about the probability that you can take a small idea, right? Your maybe your initial patent filing, and, and and grow that into a large idea, right? So presumably the companies, you know, at, at some point, you know, a startup company like Magritech will file a patent, right? And if that if that company as that company becomes more successful, it'll continue to add patents to its portfolio, right? And the and the, the slope of these curves tells us how many of those initial ideas uh, are growing to, into bigger ideas, okay? Um, so in the US, right, we can see because that slope is steeper, um, there are, uh, you know, there's more, if you, if you file uh, an individual patent, you know, there's more of those individual patents that turn into, into larger patent portfolios. Um, and, and interestingly, you'll see that, as, you know, Australia and New Zealand actually turn out to be pretty much the same. Um, we've, got a, we've got almost the same uh, uh, slope as, as, as Australia. Uh, and, and, and I will get, uh, next week I'll get into some of the more technical details of or some of the results that we've got that explain um, some of the differences in these slopes. Right now, I just want to focus in on, um, on Finland. Right? So Finland, I'm, I'm interested in the economic geography of innovation. And Finland has a, has a population and population distribution um, that's actually very similar to New Zealand. So I like to use it as an example uh, to compare to New Zealand because we can you know, to some extent, we can we can um, uh, uh, compare the agglomeration effects between uh, Finland and New Zealand. And so, if we look at we look at the Finnish um, data, right? You see, there's this point up here, right? So this is the Finnish Kauri or, or Taurau tree. Okay, this is this is Nokia. Okay, not looking quite so good um, these days, but um, uh, I, I I still like it as an example um, uh, it's, it, it, uh, uh, to look at. Uh, so we can actually we can zoom into this point, right, and see what 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 other information is sitting in this point. What other ways we can look at um, uh, uh, the way that the patents have come about for Nokia. So that that most of most of that most of that data point uh, was a very large set of patents that went into one of these. Uh, so I, I don't know how many people owned owned the, one of these Nokia these old Nokia bricks. Yes. Okay. All right. It took a while for the own up. Um, so there was a there was a point right where, where these things were cool. Um, uh, it's, it's not going. It's not. They're not quite as cool um, anymore. But nonetheless, a large a large chunk of that, that intellectual property that Nokia's amassed, you know, went into went into making this this device. Um, and we can look at we can look at that intellectual property in another way. So this is this is the um, what I've done now is is I've gone in and I've looked at the inventors. That are named on the Nokia patents. Okay, so um, so each of these dots is a, um, a Finnish engineer living in the Helsinki region, um, uh, and the connections between them are due to the uh, we, we, we've inferred based on whether people have been named on the same um, patent. Right, so we can build we can build a social network, if you like, of Finnish engineers that worked at Nokia that contributed um, towards the intellectual property that went into this device. And you'll, there's about there's about 1,500 of them, um, and and you can look at things like the growth uh, of of this network as people you know, started out as a, as a as a small network and then people join and and, and grow. But nonetheless, it's interesting to just to, to see that, that this device was as a result of a very large collaboration. Right? It's a very large number of people uh, are working together within Nokia, and of course that's you know that's why. Uh, uh, companies exist, right? They exist so that they can put together big teams um, of people to to, uh, uh, to sell products. And you can, you know, there's a, there's a number of different ways you can look at things. I like this uh, particular plot. I can look at the growth in the number of patents um, and the uh, the growth in the in, in Finnish exports and, and electronic goods. Right. So that so at the same time as, as Finland's developing this, you know, this. this uh, as Nokia is developing this large mass of intellectual property, it's actually shifting uh, uh, 
who knows who's actually selling the phones um, uh, overseas. But it had a big impact on the Finnish economy, okay, which, we, uh, which we're all aware of. Now, it's, it's also interesting, you know, it's, it's very tempting to focus on these big successes and just look at the big companies and see, how, see what they've done. And that, that's actually, it's, it is quite interesting to do that. Um, but it's also interesting to look at the other end. Okay, so, um, you know, what about these companies that are, uh, uh, just have a few patents? Um, what's going on down there? And I like to use this example. Um, uh, this is a company called Insurance of Surgical. Uh, it's a company in the US, right? So it's, it's, it's sitting on that US curve. Um, but its chief scientific officer is actually a Kiwi, Catherine Moa, and I think she's actually, she may have even given a talk um, uh, to, to Emma at some point. So some of you, some of you will have met Catherine. Um, and she, her company makes robotic um, surgery devices, right? So the idea here is, um, you know, your surgeon can play 18 rounds of golf, you know, retire to the 19th hole, um, and then, you know, log in and, um, and operate on you. Uh, and you just hope the wireless connectivity um, uh, you know, doesn't cut out halfway through the surgery. Anyway, you know, th these things are definitely, you know, th th it's, it's, a, it's a very growing market there's a, and there's a lot of exciting technologies that are being developed here. You know, really, the, the, um, the real use of course is that you might, there might be a specialist uh, on the other side of the country um, and normally you'd have to fly. Uh, to meet that specialist, but in, in principle, if, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with these robotic surgery devices, that specialist could operate on you without you having to be in the same place. But what's really interesting about this company um, is the is the network of inventors. So again, I can do the same thing. I can look at I can look at um, who Catherine has uh, filed patents with, and I can look at who they've filed patents with. And I, when I do this, I get a very very big collaboration network. So this is. This is one of the largest collaboration networks we've found. It's, it, there's about 22,000 um, people in this network. It's not, it's not dominated by a single large company. Um, it's a lot of small to medium companies. In fact, I, um, when we found this, I'd never heard of any of the companies um, in this network. But nonetheless, it's got people collaborating. Um, and, it, and it's actually it's actually geographically extended all the way along the California coast from San Diego up to, up to San Francisco. When I talk to Catherine about um, uh, uh, about the fact that she was in the world's um, one of the world's biggest collaboration networks, she was a bit, little bit startled at first. Um, you know, it's not every day a third of the rushes up to you at the conference drinks and, and starts spouting on about a collaboration network. Um, but actually, she told me a nice story, which kind of adds um, you know adds a little bit of a human touch to the to, to this analysis, and that's that. Actually, when anyone in her industry work, walks into her office, the first thing they do um, to, together is, is work out their pedigrees, right? So they, they can trace, uh, you know, I work for such and such, and oh, you work for such and such, and they can trace their origins back to a group um, uh, in the 1970s in Stanford. And indeed, when we sort of roll the movie back and, and look at uh, where this network started, we can see, um, we can see the origins of that network um, at Stanford University. So there's an important aspect to this, and that's that people, um, which again I don't have too much time to go into today, but pe people, are, people are working in this network, um, they, they have a certain degree of trust. So although they are competitors, in some sense, they're all working for different firms, right, there's an element of trust uh, because they have this, this common history that takes them back to this research group. And actually, I think that's actually one of the key things around, around collaboration, uh, is, is actually this, this uh, developing a level of trust. So. Um, so I've just, you know, we've looked at different parts of that innovation ecosystem and we've seen that, that collaboration is, is, is often a part of what's going on in the innovation ecosystem. Now we sort of have to start to think about the implications of, the, you know, the fact that we have a lot of, that, that we need a lot of collaboration uh, and we need a large number of people working together. Now we have to look at the implications for New Zealand. Okay, and this is a slightly uh, a different way of looking at intellectual property. What we've done as we've, as we've counted the number of patents uh, by region, okay? So, um, and again, and then, I'm, then I'm comparing it with the population size, okay? So, so number of patents with the population of a particular region. Now, if you are equally likely to invent something um, anywhere in New Zealand, or anywhere, this is, this is a, a mixture of Australian and New Zealand data, um, then the data would actually lie on that dashed line, right? So that dashed line uh, would just say that everywhere, um, in Australia and New Zealand had, 
produce the same number of patients per capita, right? That's what we'd see if we saw that, the data lying on that dash line. Instead, you'll see that the, the data is steeper than the dash line, right? And that means that, that broadly speaking, the larger the city, uh, the higher the output um, in patents per capita. Okay, and this is, we're certainly not the first people to find us. Um, there's been um, uh, uh, studies done in the US, US cities, for example, and Chinese cities, for example, and the same trend is found. But this is, this is the thing that's a little bit depressing for us, right? at least if you're, um, uh, if you're interested in, in counting numbers of patents, because of course, you know, our biggest city is Auckland, right? Whereas the Australians, uh, their biggest city, is, uh, biggest cities are Sydney and Melbourne, right? Their, those cities are producing more patents per capita than Auckland, and Auckland's producing more patents per capita than Wellington, um, and and so uh, so on, you know, so it goes. And what it's telling us is that, that there's something about what happens in cities, in big cities, that, that produces more uh, more innovation. And so if you if we're New Zealand, and we've you know, if our large city is only a city of about a million people. Uh, just over a million people, um, then you know this is telling us that perhaps we're going to struggle uh, to innovate in, in ways that other countries with larger population centres, larger agglomerations of people um, do. So it's quite important to actually try and figure out well what is it about cities that that, that is that's doing this, and this is this is what I'm interested in. So so one of the ways I've tried to I've tried to get at this is by looking at um, looking at collaboration within cities. Okay, so this is actually a slightly different. Um, set of data now. Um, this is I'm looking at scientific publications, um, and I've, this is these are the scientific publications that came out of Auckland in 2009. Right, and I've done this. I've done the same trick. I've looked at who's collaborating with who, um, and I've tried to, um, uh, to look at how dense uh, the collaboration networks are within Auckland. Okay, and if I do that, well, I can find so this big blob in the middle. Right, these are the group of people I can connect via scientific publications, um, and, and I can connect about 70% um, of people in Auckland uh, using scientific uh, publications. But again, we see the same sort of trend, right? But, but um, and this is slightly the fact is that in Melbourne and Sydney, I can connect even more, <coughs> uh, even larger fraction of the people um, uh, that are working in, in science and technology um, in Sydney and Melbourne than I can in Auckland. And this, this is kind of the, you know, we often think of the, the, the small world phenomena, right? We talk about the two degrees of separation between people in New Zealand. Um, well, this is actually telling us that, that in cities, actually that, you know, the, 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 um, it goes the opposite way, right? You're more likely to be connected to people uh, working in science and technology in a big city uh, than you are uh, in a small city. And there's lots of there's actually lots of data about this now. People look at uh, things like mobile phone call networks, right? So you call someone and someone else calls someone, um, and they they can reconstruct networks that way. And again, they see in bigger cities, right? People are more are more connected. So one of the things that big cities are doing, one of the reasons they exist, is to actually connect people. Now I just I want to um, touch on this on a concept. Here to, I, want, I want to look at I want to look at something else that, that, that big cities do. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna introduce this this idea of diversity and ubiquity. Okay, so I'm actually this is one of the things I'm this is one of the topics I'm going to get into um, at the treasury talk more. So if you don't it doesn't quite make sense this week, then come back next week. Um, but but diversity is a, uh, is a is a property that we can apply to countries or to cities, for example. Right. So I can look at a I can look at a particular country. I can ask how diverse is its export, are, are its exports, for example. So, you know, we saw earlier that Denmark had a very di diverse export base. I can do the same thing for patents, right? I can, I can ask how diverse are the set of patents that come out of Denmark. And then I can, you know, then I've got countries that are more specialised, right? So we saw again before that New Zealand's more specialised in, um, uh, in, uh, in agriculture. Um, and, you know, a country. Uh, like Brazil is also quite tends to be quite specialised um, uh, in, in commodities and agriculture. So that's so that applies to a country or a city or a region. Then over this side, I can look at a particular product, right? Or it could be a particular patent class, um, and I can ask uh, how novel is that particular patent class? How many different cities have a res have a revealed comparative advantage in that particular patent class? In other words, how many cities are putting out more than their fair share 
of patents in a particular area. And, you know, something like pharmaceuticals, well, there's, it, it turns out that there's not many places that, that can actually uh, do pharmaceuticals, right? So we assign that high novelty versus, um, say, uh, <coughs> milk powder or, or dairy products, <coughs> we call these ubiquitous, right? Because there are a lot of countries that can produce these types of goods. So then I can start to ask questions about, again, you know, do, do cities promote uh, diversity or ubiquity and novelty. And, uh, well, actually, the first thing we can do is we can try and work out the relationships between uh, different types of products, right? By, by looking at whether um, uh, products co occur in certain countries, right? We can, uh, for example, uh, 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 milk and milk powder, right, will tend to, will tend to co occur. So there's probably some relationship between the ability to produce milk and milk powder. Um, or, for example, we could look at pharmaceuticals and we could ask whether, you know, pharmaceuticals, do they go with medical devices, for example? You know, do you tend, tend to see uh, robotic surgery devices coming out of the same cities or regions as you might see pharmaceuticals? And if we do that and we go, we use the world data set of, of patents, so this is actually patents now, there's an equivalent piece of work that's been done by some physicists in, in the US using products. We, because we can, we can zero patents right down to individual companies, we can build a much richer um, uh, map and we can ask questions about cities that <coughs> people are working with products can't. So this is, this is our map of the relationships between different types of technologies. And I'm really just going to flash this up in front of you now and not get into it, and, and this is an editorial for the Treasury Report. So if you want to get, if you want to understand this, then come along next week and I'll talk more about it. But what we can do is we can start asking questions now about how does, how does population size affect the diversity um, of, of particular patent classes. Okay, so here's a, uh, this is a plot, this is, um, I've got data from, largely from Europe and Asia. Um, uh, uh, when I went to, to produce this plot, I was having trouble with my US data, but the, the US data doesn't significantly deviate from this. So the, so the, the blue data is, um, uh, is the <coughs> diversity of patent classes that particular cities or regions have revealed comparative advantage in. And you'll see as the population increases, right, you'll see that the diversity increases. Right? So perhaps that's, that's not terribly surprising. Right? If you're a bigger population centre, you can do more things. Um, uh, there are more people uh, and they can get together and, and work in, in, in different areas. Um, here's New Zealand. So the black data is New Zealand. Uh, and actually, uh, so that's Auckland. Um, Christchurch and Wellington, and you'll see that we, roughly speaking, follow that follow that trend. Now I can also look at ubiquity, right? So so ubiquity is the inverse, uh, if you like, of novelty, right? So if you want to think of novelty, things down here are very novel, things up here uh, are, are ubiquitous, right? So um, so again, we see that there's an effect of population, right? So the larger the population size in a particular region, uh, the the, the less ubiquitous the technologies that they have, uh, that they have comparative advantage in. Okay, so so actually this is the average ubiquity of the pay, of the particular types of patents that come out of a particular region. And again, you know, New Zealand sort of um, follows this trend, although um, you know, worryingly, Auckland, right, the, the the novelty of the patents that are coming out of Auckland um, is actually sitting on the wrong side um, of this curve. Oops, and. And so actually when we compare diversity uh, to ubiquity, we, we see quite um, a, a strong relationship between diversity and ubiquity. Um, so the, you know, there's a correlation between having a diverse uh, set of, uh, of, of patent classes that you've got a comparative advantage in uh, versus the, the ubiquity of those patent classes. So the more diversity you've got in your particular uh, region or city, uh, the more novelty on average that your patent classes have. So let, let's just sort of um, see what this means for New Zealand. So, so I'm going to put this together and, and sort of come up with a hypothesis. So, you know, we've seen that bigger cities produce more patents per capita, right? And these patents tend to be of, of higher novelty um, than, than smaller cities. Um, and you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's another fact that the bigger cities support the <coughs> diversity uh, of patent classes. And then, and this, sorry, 
um, sort of a, a hiccup in my, my innovators there. You know, we can see that people who are innovating seem to be better connected in bigger cities. Okay, so the hypothesis is that actually, you know, what's going on uh, in, in bigger cities is that inventors are actually exploiting uh, the, the denser and more diverse uh, networks of expertise that are available to them in bigger cities to generate uh, new knowledge. Okay, now, so this, this is, in a way, this is, this is summing up the New Zealand dilemma because we haven't got uh, these big uh, population centres. So we have to think of other ways. If we want to be more innovative, if we want um, innovation to contribute more to our economy, um, we've got to think of ways in which perhaps we can build um, denser and more diverse networks in our innovation ecosystem. So, you know, this is, a, this is another cute way of looking at an innovation ecosystem. These are all our inventors. Um, I think over about the last 20 years, at least these are, these are patent people who have filed patents in the European Patent Office. I don't know if we have, do we have anyone here? Almost always one. Um, not usually not more than one. Um, uh, if, if, so if you're in our database, we found where you live because people um, people usually give their home address um, when they when they um, uh, when they sign away the patent. They, they sign their invention to the to the company they work for, um, and we can also work out your network based on who you've worked with. Okay, so that's what we've done with this map. Um, and, and again, we can see, you know, we can see exactly what uh, uh, what I talked about in the previous slide. We can see the fact that the, the networks of people uh, are denser in the bigger cities. There are more inventors in our, uh, per capita in our bigger cities, and so there's, you know, there's a sense in which we're behaving, um, uh, you know, just as expected. So, so what can we do about this? Well, um, you know, the, the the phrase I've been using, and, and you know, I, I guess the population. You know, whether I say four or five million people fluctuates from talk to talk. Uh, sometimes I'm also I'm also referring to the you know million or so Kiwis that we have overseas that we can connect to. Um, but really, we need to think about ways in which we can bring people together in the in the way uh, that a, that a city does, right? And so so we need to have better connectivity across the country, um, and and we need to to think about making sure that we've got diverse connectivity. So it's not just about getting particular industry sectors to talk together. It's about having uh, people within, sorry, people within particular industry sectors to talk together. It's actually about ensuring that, that people are talking together across uh, industry sectors to ensure that uh, that there's diversity built into our network. And so, you know, so so you know, you can do things like roll out broadband and um, and tell everybody to go out and collaborate and, and fund centres of research excellence, etc. Uh, but it's it's no use unless people actually start sharing ideas. Okay, so. So we need more connectivity, and we also need um, people to start uh, sharing ideas. And again, when we look at sort of the amount of co-patenting that goes on between New Zealand companies and New Zealand organisations, um, and compare that to what's going on overseas, we see there's a relatively low amount of co-patenting, right? So whether that's because you know we're perhaps too diverse, or um, uh, or uh, you know we're not we're not used to collaborating, um, I'm not sure. Personally, I think actually we sort of tend to lack the trust in, within New Zealand. We actually openly exchange ideas. We tend to hold on to things ourselves um, and, uh, and and not exchange ideas. So we, we, you know, we need to not only build a network. We need to encourage people to use the network. We do need to invest in science and innovation. And, and I guess pick every, you know probably every week you have someone turning up um, and, and, and saying that at EB. You know, here's here's our um, this is our. Uh, our R&D intensity in New Zealand over the last um, uh, 30 years, you know, we've, we've seen a positive trend um, over the last decade. Um, you know, there was the knowledge wave, uh, for example. Um, I guess it's kind of it's like Lyle Bay on a calm day. Right? Um, you know, and, and you know, it's it's not like I'm I'm sure I'm not the first person to turn up here and say this, right? And you can go back in 1987. You know, we had a royal commission that, that looked at things, and, and they called for a doubling of research spending over seven years. Um, and it's a little bit depressing when you compare, you know, to how uh, to how Finland has gone. And um, and the title up there is um, is Finnish, at least Google Translate. Uh, it was the Google Translate version that called that a knowledge waste. So we do need to we do need to think about ways in which we can uh, increase um, R and D spending. 
So um, I'm just going to finish off. I just want to talk about. I'm just going to give you one last, one last thought. Um, and, and I'm just going to talk about two uh, New Zealand innovations. And, and one, of course, led to Icebreaker. Uh, not, a you know, not, a, not a very high tech innovation, but, it, but really a, uh, an idea about how to market something. Mm -hmm. you know, that's from an innovation. Of course, it's based on the merino wool fibre. Um, and, and New Zealand is very comfortable selling wool. We've been doing it for 100 years. Um, and it you know, came out of um, um, uh, Jeremy Moon visiting a, uh, a, a farm state. Uh, an island in, in, in the Marlborough Sounds, um, and its revenue is about 100 million uh, US dollars. There's another um, Kiwi invention. It's, it's led to a company that's got revenues of about $3 billion. It was um, uh, first discovered in Auckland, uh, this, this, well, first made this innovation in Auckland. It's based on expanded polytetrafluoroethylene. Uh, anyone, anyone who hasn't seen me talk about this before, if anyone want to take a guess what that is. It's certainly not something, right? That as a kiwi, right? Would you, would you, would you try selling, you know, pop expanded polytetrafluoroethylene? Is it? No. Uh, related. It's Gore-Tex. Um, so, so this is basically stretched Teflon, right? And there was a guy in Auckland who worked out uh, a way of stretching Teflon so that it perforated, right? Um, so, and so perforated Teflon. It's got small pores. Allow water vapor to come through, but because it's, it's hydrophobic, uh, water droplets won't actually pen penetrate into the into the pores. And I guess it's it's interesting to think, you know, why, you know, if you own some icebreaker, right, you almost certainly own some Gore-Tex or some equivalent fabric, right? The markets for these things uh, are almost identical, right? You're selling them to the same people. Why is it that we can't sell merino wool fiber? Uh, or why is it we can sell merino wool fiber but not expand it? Well, so here's my take on it, and, and I, I guess I'm going to refer you, I'm going to look at the branding. Okay, so here's, here's the icebreaker branding. We all know, you know, it's a very innovative, um, it's a very cutting edge uh, marketing technique, but you know, you, you, you always see the natural, you know, okay, there's, there's often some, some lightly dressed, strange looking people <laughs> by a certain degree of inbreeding in New Zealand, but, but you always see, you always see um, the landscape, right? This is a product. That, that is of the land, right? And, and I think as New Zealanders, we're really comfortable in that space. We're really comfortable selling things based on our natural environment. Gore-Tex, you know, I mean, it simply says this is a product that works, right? It'll, it'll keep you dry. Um, and I often, I often think that as New Zealanders, we, 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 uh, we're missing opportunities to sell things based on our know-how, right? We don't, we, we, we don't often use our know-how uh, to sell our product. We're often relying on our image and, and, and what's really essentially marketing to sell products. So, um, you know, my last my last comment is that, that I think we need to see ourselves as people of knowledge, not just of, of nature, right? We, we, can, we can sell things because we're smart and they work. Um, and and uh, I'd like to see us doing more of that. Okay, so I think we've got some time uh, for questions, and I'll just put up the brochure of this product later. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think it, it is it is going to be both, and and you can see, you know, when you look at countries like like Denmark and, and Finland, um, you see that they've done, you know, this, um, Finland's still in forestry, it's still making paper, it still has its traditional industries. Um, you know, there was, I guess, I guess Finland shifted out of textiles, right? So as it, as its technology economy picked up, you can see that, that it, its textile industry has declined. Um, so it may be that we lose, you know, that the we got this right, say, and I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure, it's, it's your guys' job to come up with the magic formula, right? Um, I'm just trying to prod in your suggestions. But if you got, you know, you might lose some amount of industry, but I, but I think the primary industries are always going to be here, and we do have natural advantages uh, in the primary sector. And um, and so I don't think it's, I don't think it's either or. What does worry me um, is if we, if we,
Karen on the primary sector. You know, I'm worried about the fact that, that there's a you know, there's a lack of diversity. You know, if you look at the, the, the relationship between diversity and novelty, um, I'm I'm worried about that. And certainly, when you look at our productivity um, in agriculture, um, it, it, it certainly hasn't it's not grown fast enough uh, for us to keep up with some of our, our competitors. And and you know, and I guess this is this is an, this is an anecdote really. You know, I'm a theoretical <laughs> physicist. And I've worked on problems in the primary sector. Um, so the type of work I do, which is often in nanotechnology, can be applied to the, to the primary sector. You don't necessarily get the reverse. Um, and I'm worried if we don't, you know, if you're missing those nanotechnologists, if, you're not, if you don't have that broader research base, then you're missing opportunities to grow productivity in the primary sector. As the agony of the boat race kind of fades, <laughs> uh, and, and I even, I mean, I've been here 30 years, so I can't get rid of this. <laughs> it, it, do you see it as a celebration of the technology? Because really the only thing on the American boat was American money. And it was a really good showcase of New Zealand technology. Do you really think, in your view, that is going to really lever us, lever, the leverage from that is going to some, achieve some of that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I, you know, I, mean, I guess I'm not, I haven't done a, like, you know, I don't know how big the markets are for America's cup yachts or whatever. I guess there'll be another race. <laughs> but, but, so I don't, I'm not sure about how that spills over into other markets. But, you know, it sounds like we might be asked to build some more yachts for the next one. Um, but, but certainly, it's, it's, you know, I do, I do think the fact that we're celebrating the technology that went into those, into those boats, and we've, you know, as, maybe as a consolation prize, I think I've heard Ian Taylor on the radio saying it was great that we lost. But now we can focus on the real, the real win, which is about the technology that we need. Uh, do you think the rather critical dynamics uh, beyond what you've covered? Uh, I say this because obviously in New Zealand, most intellectual property is not in the form of patents. Patents is not codified, or it's another form of codification, such as uh, copyright or plant variety rights or something. So there are obviously other dynamics going on. And uh, so New Zealand's been a huge business market advantage, uh, but we don't have the global networks that they have. So are there other dynamics to be looking at? Yeah, I mean, so, so I guess the, the, the first question was um, about <coughs> is, pay, is, is looking at patents enough? To and I don't think it is. Um, uh, so you have to, I mean, patents give you sort of one slice in, in a way through the, through the, uh, but I'm going to use the word again, innovation ecosystem. <laughs> right, they, they're one way of looking at it, and of course there are other ways. And they're, they're, they're a natural data source to use because they're, you know, they're open, and, and you get a lot of information uh, openly from them. But they certainly don't tell the whole story. So you do have to look at a range of other evidence. And I guess I guess that's what you know, I've talked about. My research was about patents, but you, do try, you then try and set it in terms of other evidence and try and see how consistent this picture you're finding with other other measures. So I don't think patents are the, the end. And then the, the second part of your question is about those global networks. That, that you know, clearly one of the things that, that you know, part of what I'm talking about is about knowledge transfer across distance, um, and and how people collaborate across distance. Um, and and we're we're very distant. And, and so that's clearly sorry. We don't have global networks. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I definitely think that's, that's an important part of the picture. And so when I talk about connecting up New Zealand, we also have to uh, connect with the rest of the world. Um, so I do think that by building better connectivity within New Zealand, that actually, that actually helps build connectivity with the rest of the world because we've become a more interesting place. Right? And, and it's a two -way, you know, building networks is a two-way thing. Um, uh, people, we have to be doing something interesting here to get people overseas to actually take note of what we've done. Should we be including Australia in that, uh, in that, you know, in the same way Denmark talks to Sweden and Finland? Yeah, well, and we do we do have pretty good networks with Australia. Um, so, you know, Australia, up, I think up until recently, they were still, uh, did China pass it? Yeah, so in terms of the, in terms of the collaboration networks, we do see, see quite strong networks with Australia. Um. Yeah, I have a question on your, um, Sean, uh, on the numbers of total exports, and, when, and if you does your analysis pick up on the the fact that the patents per novelty 
and patents or non-patents per ubiquity in margins. Because I'm an investor, I've invested yep. in, in, in half a dozen companies that we've filed a number of patents and we have a number of programs and we have ex but we play with an exit strategy. Yep. But our focus is always on not the volume of the of, of the dollar but the, but the margin within the dollar. Uh, so 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 sort of the value add that you're yeah, well, we sell milk for seven bucks right, a kilo, right. yeah, and we so can do something that raises it to a thousand dollars a kilo. But where do we so, drive? So that's sort of what we're trying to get at a little bit with that ubiquity novelty, mm, right? So, uh, so, and, and I guess um, what we haven't been out, you know, so we haven't we haven't gone far enough that I could I could tell you put a dollar value on 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 novelty or ubiquity. We can we can see that that correlates quite well uh, with a number of um, you know, if we, go, if, we do it, if we work at the country level, we can look at some country level economic statistics, mm. and we can see that we, you know, if you're producing, if your if your goods, if your goods are the correlation more novel, with the GDP, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. The good, the more novel your goods, and again we see a correlation between, and the more novel your patent, the higher your GDP uh, per capita seems to be. And also, I guess there's some, there's some work that's been done by. Um, by the physicists in the US that, that have looked at products, and they they actually um, claim that they they can predict countries' growth mm. by 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 you know if you're if you if you're producing some quite novel goods or or, um, or novel patents, uh, uh, and but you're below that GDP you know GDP line, then they they actually uh, will predict that your growth will be higher. So is your book behind this saying that we should be Penalising investment into uh, programs which don't lead to good patents and strong margins. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm going to advocate penalising. <laughs> well, it's about incentives. Uh, yeah. If I you incentivise the same, you will get the same. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I, you know, the way I look at it is, is we have had a very primary sector focus, and, and particularly we put a lot of our a lot of the um, public sector dollars go into the primary sector, mm. and, and it's very targeted as well. Um, so we, we often have a very narrow sector target um, uh, put on, the, on on those dollars. And so I guess I'm arguing that we need a we need a, a greater variety of um, of knowledge inputs. And so from our public sector funding, I'd like to see a broader range of things uh, funded in, in the public sector. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm not enough of, of an economist. You know, when you, when you start talking about incentives. Now, if you compare the New Zealand uh, big cities to the similar size cities in other countries, uh, have you found out some other things that are remarkably better in innovation? Are they really communicating better, or are they just close to other big cities? Oh, uh, no, the, well, the Scandinavian cities, <coughs> you know, on all these metrics, just sit, sit way, you know, sit way, you know, the more connected, um, the patents they're producing are, uh, are um, uh, uh, more novel, you know. So a lot, so you know. So Scandinavian cities look very good, but they do have Europe uh, sitting right there. Um, Anne Simon from the University of Auckland. Um, I was wanting to pick up on the point about missing critical dynamics potentially, uh, because I think um, I found that early on in the book it's sort of lost by copying in a way, or I. I I think the idea of innovation ecosystems and the application of the science of contact systems to the future of the country is quite fabulous. But you did fall into this kind of split between nature and culture, people in the environment, learning in the land, I think, early on. And I would think that you're right about, for example, just upping volume in our primary production, but there are other alternatives, and that is to introduce greater complexity and diversity and embrace them into the innovation ecosystem. <coughs> To up the value chain and to to generate use new systems or experiment with new systems of production, which are not just based on industrial models, for example, and this is happening in other parts of the world at the moment. But equally, the other thing, the stuff that I think is missing, is the sense of the opportunities that are there in our social networks. And um, you know, there's a lot of uh, in you make the point about the concentration of the population in Auckland. 
Um, that's growing, of course, with the danger of hollowing out the other centres. But there's also a very rapid turnover of population, growing diversity, um, and at the same time, growing inequities. And these are all dynamics that I think bear on the question of innovation ecosystems. And we really need to make this analysis a bit more complicated, I think, and more knowledgeable in that, those areas as well. I think, I, yeah, I did, I did try and touch on that in the last, in the last chapter a little bit, but um, yeah, so no, I, did, I, I, you know, I definitely think that that's, that's part of it, it's, it, you know, you can't have a, uh, uh, you know, we can't have parts of, a, parts of, the, um, uh, of New Zealand or, or um, uh, groups in New Zealand that are, that are, that are cut off uh, demographically and, and economically from the rest of us, right, it is about, when I talk about the city of 4 million people, it is really about making use of Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree that, that, that that's something that, that um, I would, you know, I'd like to work on that. And uh, I've got some ideas about uh, um, uh, how to do that. And I'm talking to some people in different faculties. So I am moving, to, I am agglomerating the University of Auckland, and I've been talking to people in different faculties about um, and actually I'm moving to it to try and get this going.